Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to talk to you today about bees. Um, I, I've been studying bees for um, 20 something years now. And when I say that to people, they usually assume that I'm a, a beekeeper, that I've got honeybees, and, and that's what I study. But that isn't what I study. I actually don't do work on honeybees at all. Um, I, I focus on the other bees, particularly um, bumblebees. Uh, now, a lot of people, I think, don't. I'm sure nobody here, um, but lots of the general public think there's one species of bee, as far as I can tell. And it lives in a box and it makes honey. But if you ask them to draw a bee, they'll draw something that's big and round and flat with yellow and black stripes. So they're kind of confused because the thing they've drawn is a kind of cartoon bumblebee. Um, and it's a honeybee that lives in the hive and, and makes the honey that the beekeepers look after. Honeybees are, are domestic animals, basically, in this part of the world. But there are loads of wild bees, and those are the ones that I'm interested in. So these are some bumblebees on a, on a cardoon flower. These are the kind of typical big, furry, stripy bees. 26 different species in the UK, and some of them are easy to identify, um, some of them are quite tricky. Um, but you'll see at least half a dozen in any back garden if you grow some nice, pretty big flowers for them, which I'll talk about later. But then there are, that is just the tip of the iceberg. There are loads of other bees. Um, they tend to get forgotten. Most people don't know they exist. Most people have never noticed these things. But if you look at flowers in the spring and summer, you will see these mostly smaller little, little things, reddish, brownish, blackish bees, some of them quite furry, some quite shiny, um, easy to overlook, some of them are really tiny. But they're all out there. They're all living in the wild, doing important things, pollinating wildflowers, pollinating their crops and so on. And they all need looking after them. It's kind of a shame that the other bees all get forgotten. Um, let me just show you a few pictures of some bees to start off with. Um, so this is the uh, British bee, this is the leaf cutter bee. Can we have bee. the light out, please? Sorry? Can we have the light out, please? Yes, you certainly can. Is that better? Thank you. <laughs> um, this, <laughs> this is a leaf cutter bee, uh, which is a, 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 these, these solitary bees, uh, as are most of those uh, the bulk of bee species, they don't live in a hive with a queen and workers, they live on their own. So the female will find a little hole, and in this species, the, the leaf cutter bees, they actually go and they cut little semicircles of leaves with their mandibles, do they love rose leaves, and then they carry a piece of leaf, and see, if, you look, if you're lucky, you'll see them flying, they can carry a piece of leaf bigger than themselves, so it looks quite odd, and they line the tube uh, with, with uh, bits of rose leaf or whatever leaf they've chosen stuck together and they fill it with pollen, they lay their eggs in it and they seal it up at the end uh, and the larvae just um, eat the pollen, grow on their own, nobody looks after them, the mother leaves them alone once she's stopped the nest. Um, and they, are, they have one generation a year, most of these species, and, uh, and so the next year they hatch out and they do the same thing again. Um, I'll show you sort of how you can make solitary bee nests uh, towards the end. Um, so, uh, but then there are bees that look very like wasps. This is actually a, a, a cuckoo bee, um, which, uh, although it's a bee, it, it um, has become a parasite on other bees. And there are actually about 60 British species of cuckoo bee of different sorts. Um, but instead of finding their own nest and filling it with pollen and laying their eggs, they, they, they find the nests of another solitary bee, uh, or in some cases bumblebees, um, and they go in and they lay their own eggs and their own eggs. Um, they, they both eat the, um, the offspring of the host bee, and then they eat all its food, which seems kind of mean. But anyway, that's what they do. Um, in the tropics, there are some really wonderful, beautiful bees of different types. There's even blue bees. This is the thing the blue banded amagilla. Um, and look at this, this really spectacular thing. This is an orchid bee um, from Central and South America. Um, some of these get really big as well, beautiful things, and they're, they're called orchid bees because they, the males, um, each species of bee visits a particular species of orchid, and it gathers the, the floral scent from the orchid and it, it stores it. The males have big, swollen, hollow legs, uh, and they stuff the scent into their legs, and then they use that scent to persuade females to make them. <laughs> Um, very, very beautiful things, worth going to South America. Then there are quite a lot of insects that pretend to be bees, but actually aren't bees, particularly there are lots of species of fly that have evolved to mimic bees, because that then gives them protection from predators, because predators have learned that bees tend to have stings, and that they're dangerous things to try and eat. Um, actually, this, to be fair, is, 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 this is a fly, not a bee, 
uh, to the huge embarrassment of the audience at this point. <laughs> 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 to, to be fair to them, um, they didn't see the cover until 4,000 copies had been printed. Um, and, and they would have known immediately that this was a fly. But unfortunately, the publishers just went ahead and did it without telling anyone. Um, anyway, never mind. Uh, but there were some fly species in the UK which were really good. Bumblebee and bee mimics, lovely, beautiful, furry things that many people would mistake for a room and bee. That actually just looks pretty much like a fly to me. Yeah. Um, these are the ones that I specialise in study, studying uh, bumblebees um, that have kept me busy for a couple of decades <coughs> thus far. Um, why, what's so interesting and special about bumblebees? Um, I said a rate of 26 UK species, which, which is just over 10% of all the bumblebees in the world. It's about 250 globally. Um, bumblebees are, are all social bees, um, uh, but they live in much smaller colonies than the honeybee. Uh, bumblebees have an annual life cycle. So at the moment, there are young-ish, six-month-old queen bees um, alive, underground, waiting in, in, a, in a few weeks to come, maybe actually this month if we get some warm weather, um, they'll come out, they'll come out of hibernation, they'll burrow up to the light, and then you'll see these great big, the queens are bigger than any, any other uh, bumblebees, you see them flying around, visiting flowers, things like pussy willow and pulmonaria and so on, um, and then you'll see them flying around low to the ground, looking for a hole in the ground that they might nest in, they, they look for old rodent burrows, rabbit burrows and so on, and if, if, if they find a hole, they'll go and explore. You see them disappear underground. Uh, and they're hoping to find an old abandoned mouse nest or something similar with some cozy bedding that they can build their own nest in. Um, and if they do find all of that, they, they then gather a ball of pollen, they lay some eggs in it, and then they sit on it and they, they incubate it just like a bird. So they actually shiver their flight muscles to generate heat uh, and to keep their brood warm so that they can develop quickly early in the year when it's still quite cold. Um, and all being well, after three or four weeks, um, those eggs hatch as, um, as workers, as daughters. So all the workers in a bumblebee or a honeybee next to female. Males don't do any work at all. Um, and most of the bees are females. So all she produces all the way through the spring are, are, are daughters, workers. Um, as soon as she's got the first batch of adult daughters, she never leaves the nest again. She stays underground for the rest of her life, and her daughters take over the dangerous job of collecting food and bringing it back to the nest. Um, and the nest grows to maybe have a couple of hundred workers by June or July, and then um, the nest produces new queens and males, finally. Um, and the new queens uh, fly out from the nest, uh, they mate very quickly with males that are flying around. Um, as I said, the males don't do anything other than mate, that's their, their only job in life. And almost as soon as the queens have mated, they've just mated with one male once in their whole life, it takes about half an hour, and then they burrow into the ground and they sleep right through to the next spring. They, some species go into hibernation as early as June, so they're actually asleep for most of the year. Um, those queens, which brings us back to where we are today. Um, the, the old queen, the old nest, all the workers, they, they slowly die off in, in late summer. And the males, um, hopefully their job done, they also die off. But there's a slightly sad thing, which is that there are uh, about seven times as many males born as new queens. And because the queens only made once, that means that six out of seven males never get to do the only thing that they were born to do, um, which is kind of sad, I think. But anyway, um, <laughs> Bumblebees are, are, are particularly associated with cold, wet places um, like Britain uh, or the Arctic or the, the Alps or the Himalayas. So, so this diagram shows you the, the distribution of all the bumblebee species in the world and the, 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 the numbers indicate how many species of bumblebee can be found in different places. And if you can't read the numbers, the colours indicate the kind of bumblebee hotspots. So the, the nearest place that's really good for bumblebees to us is the Alps. But the best place of all is here, where you could, if you were going to go on holiday just to see bumblebees, which I don't suppose you will, but I might, um, <laughs> that would be the place to go. Somewhere in the eastern Himalayas, and we think that's where bumblebees first evolved about 30 million years ago. So bees evolved from, from wasps a long, long time ago, about 120 million years ago, we think, back in the age of dinosaurs. Um, they're, they're essentially they're, they're, they're sort of wasps gone vegetarian, really. Um, bumblebees came quite a bit later, as I said, about 30 million years ago after the dinosaurs had gone, but long before there were people on Earth. Um, back then there were giant mammoths and 
tree sloths, and not tree sloths, brown sloths, and all sorts of other giant mammals wandering here. Um, we think they appeared somewhere around here anyway, which is still, as I say, the hotspot today. And they spread west to Europe over time, and they spread east through Siberia and into Alaska, and then down through the Americas. They tend to fizzle out if you go southwards. So, so for most insects, if you're interested in butterflies or dragonflies or whatever, the further south you go in Europe, the more species you find. Um, but bumblebees are the exception to that. If you go to the Mediterranean, there are hardly any bumblebees at all. Go to Africa, there are none. It's too hot. Um, they're big furry insects adapted to keeping warm in cold weather. They actually overheat in, in warm weather. Um, and in fact, the only place that made it down over the equator is in, in the Americas because there are mountains all the way down through um, and over the equator, the Andes, so that they could follow the mountain chains, which was relatively cool. And so some managed to get into South America, but they're predominantly cool northern hemisphere creatures. And they're spectacularly good at, at uh, dealing with cold conditions, much better than almost any other insect. Um, uh, around. So this is not a very good picture, but this was taken in London a couple of years ago. You can see this in your garden around here. This was taken in January. Um, it's a bumblebee uh, feeding on Mahonia flowers, as you've probably guessed. And uh, this is snow, obviously. Um, the, the air temperature where that photo was taken was about zero <coughs> degrees, but inside the bee it was about 30 degrees centigrade, wow. uh, which is an extraordinary temperature difference to be able, you know, to, be able to maintain. Um, this is an infrared picture of a bumblebee, just to kind of illustrate the point. And you can see so that this is the head of the bee, that's the thorax, which is where the flight muscles are attached, and, and the legs. And this is the abdomen at the back. And it's this, you can see that this is where the heat is produced from those flight muscles. The thorax is just packed with muscles um, that power the bee along. Um, she has to flap her wings about 200 times a second um, to stay in the air. Um, we, if you try flapping your arms 200 times a second, you, can, you get hot very quickly. Um, it's two and a half times faster than a hummingbird, the, the speed of wings of a, of a bumblebee. Um, and that's how they generate the heat and can fly in cold weather. But it comes at a, at a cost. It is hugely energetically expensive to fly, uh, to, to, to flap your wings so fast. Um, so someone once calculated that um, a running man who burns the calories in a Mars bar in about an hour of running, which is a bit of a depressing statistic if you're going for a run to burn off that moment of weakness at coffee time. Um, uh, if you happen to be a man-sized bumblebee, which would be pretty exciting, uh, you would burn those calories in 30 seconds of flying. So it kind of illustrates how much energy it needs to take. Yeah, which basically means they need lots of flowers, lots of nectar-rich, sugar-rich um, flowers. Uh, and it's the shortage of those flowers, which has um, cost them in recent years. And sort of relating to that, um, I'm just going to read you a tiny bit, of this, which is my first memory of bumblebees from when I was about seven, um, which I described in here. I should have got this open before I started. I forgot. So bear with me. Okay, there we go. Um, on one occasion, after a heavy summer rainstorm, I found a number of bedraggled bumblebees clinging to my buddhia and decided to dry them out. Unfortunately for the bees, I was perhaps a bit too young to have a good grasp of the practicalities. With hindsight, getting my mom's hair dryer and giving them a gentle blow dry might have been the most sensible option. Instead, I laid the torpid bees on the hot plate of the electric cooker, <laughs> covered them in a layer of tissue paper and turned the hot plate onto my own. Being young, I got bored of waiting for them to warm up and wandered off to feed my gerbils. Sadly, my attention didn't return to the bees until I noticed the smoke. The tissue paper had caught fire and the poor bees had been frazzled. I felt terrible. My first foray into bumblebee conservation was a catastrophic disaster. <laughs> I got slightly better at looking at them. Actually, they're probably the best thing to do if you find a grounded bumblebee, which you often do, particularly in the spring when the weather's cold. If they've run out of energy, they can't fly, and they're not going to get to flowers. If you just give them a bit of sugar water, um, they fire, you know, that's all they need to warm themselves up and eventually take off, and it usually works. Um, don't say that to them. Um, so, bees have evolved lots of ways of finding food efficiently, um, because they need so much of it, not just to, to power their own flight and to keep warm, but also to take back to their offspring. They're more or less the only insects that feed their offspring exclusively on pollen and nectar. 
Uh, lots of adult insects feed on flowers themselves to, for the pollen and nectar, but none of the part from bees take it back, or very few apart from bees take it back to feed their offspring as well. So they need to be able to find lots of food, lots of flowers, and the right kinds of flowers very efficiently. So they need to be able to learn which ones are rewarding, they need to be able to navigate from patch to patch and then back to their hive efficiently. Uh, and they're amazingly clever and can do all sorts of things. Um, uh, most of which I haven't got time to talk about, but I'll just, just explain one, which is the thing that first got me interested in bumblebees as a professional biologist 20 years after the, 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 the incident I just read about. Um, so I was watching some bumblebees, and this is something anyone can see anywhere in, uh, whether it's flowers and bees in the spring or summer. If you, you watch a bee as she flies about, you'll see she goes from flower to flower, obviously, um, but she doesn't land on every flower. She very often flies up to a flower, gets very close to it, as this bee is doing. She has her antennae out at the front, um, but she veers away at the last second. She flies up to it, and then she goes on to the next flower, without actually landing or touching the flower or trying to drink the nectar. Um, and she might do that three or four times before she lands and then feeds. Um, and I was so watching her. I don't know why she's doing that. What's, what's wrong with the flowers she's not landing on? Um, Presumably, she was rejecting them for some reason, but I couldn't see any difference between the good ones and the bad ones, as it were. Um, so I, I sent back trying to find out. Uh, it took about five years. I had a PhD student, Jane Stout, who did her PhD on this. And, and together, we kind of eventually unraveled what was going on. And uh, to cut a long story short, um, it turns out that every time a bee lands on a flower, she accidentally leaves behind a little kind of smelly footprint, a smear of oils from the cuticle, from her skin. In exactly the same way as, as if, if, when you hold a glass and put it down, you leave a fingerprint, a little smear of greases from your fingers on the glass. Um, they're not doing it deliberately, they accidentally leave this little trace behind on the flower. And then subsequent bees are sniffing the flowers, and if they can smell the smell of a recent footprint from a previous visitor, they know there won't be any nectar in the flower because that previous bee will have taken it and it takes a while for flowers to fill up again. Uh, so there's no point in landing on a flower that smells of bee because it will be empty. Um, and so they save themselves maybe half a second in landing and putting their tongue into the flower, um, which doesn't sound like much, but if you're, you're visiting 10,000 flowers a day, which a bee often does, um, then that adds up and it, it just means they're a bit quicker at collecting rewards of finding the flowers that have actually got something in them. Um, very clever little creatures. So in all this gathering food for themselves and their offspring, um, they're very efficient pollinators. Um, bees generally are, are, are the most abundant and important pollinators. I should, should say there are lots of other insects that are also important pollinators, <coughs> like flies and beetles and, and, and butterflies and so on. But bees are the kind of masters of pollination and, and we depend on them for a lot of our food. So about three quarters of crops, the types of crop that people grow in the world, benefit from some kind of pollination by a, a, an insect. And, and the bulk of that is delivered by bees. So if we didn't have bees, then, then our diet would be missing most of the fruits and vegetables that we like to eat. There'd be no raspberries, there'd be no strawberries, no blueberries, no courgettes, no runner beans, no tomatoes, no chili peppers, and so on. I could go on and on, but you get the idea. Um, so, um, they're very important. Um, uh, without them, uh, life would be rubbish. And of course, wildflowers wouldn't set seed and would disappear too. So we need to look after our bees. And hence, it's really worrying that some of them are, are doing very, very badly. Some of them have disappeared. Um, so I'll just show you one example. Um, this is the great yellow bumblebee, a lovely, beautiful, big bumblebee. Um, it used to be found a hundred years ago. Um, it was found all over uh, England and Wales. It wasn't the commonest of bees in the south, but it was here, it was everywhere. Um, by the second half of the 20th century, most of those populations have gone extinct in England and Wales. And if you want to see one today, you've got to go to the very far north and west of Scotland. It's extinct in England and Wales. And it's not alone in, in doing this, actually. There, there are three species that have gone completely extinct in all of Britain. Um, uh, and similar things are happening elsewhere in, in the world. Um, in fact, one bumblebee um, seems to have gone globally extinct just recently. I think called Franklin's bumblebee. It hasn't now been seen for 
10 years, despite lots of people looking for it. That was an American species, it seems to be gone forever. So we're losing our, our bumblebees one by one, which is really sad. One bit of a problem we have, well, we have good distribution maps like that for countries like Britain, um, but we don't have a good population monitoring scheme for bumblebees. There's a really great one in, in Britain for butterflies, where volunteers walk transects um, every fortnight and count butterflies, and they've been doing that since the 1970s, so we've got really good data on how butterfly populations are changing, which species are declining most rapidly, and so on, which is really useful, because then you can target your your conservation efforts on the species that need it most in the parts of the country where, the, where, the, where it's needed most and so on. Uh, but we don't have that kind of scheme for bumblebees. In fact, we've tried to set one up, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later because there's a scope for people to join in. Um, actually, what we'd ideally have is um, a way of counting the nests um, because that each bumblebee nest is one breeding female. So that would actually, from a sort of technical population biologist perspective, uh, what you really want to know is how many breeding adults have you got in the population. Um, uh, so if one could survey bumblebee nests and do that every year and see how the numbers of each species were changing over time, that would be really fantastic. Um, and it's always been a, a big obstacle for people who study bumblebees that it's really hard to find their nests. If you're a keen gardener, you find them by accident every now and again. They often turn up in compost heaps or uh, these days in, in tip boxes is one particular species that does that. Um, but, it, but to survey all the nests in an area is, is not an impossible because they're all hidden underground in tiny little holes. Um, so we had an idea, this is about 10 years ago. Um, uh, we, we knew that badgers are one of the biggest um, predators of bumblebees. Um, uh, which is actually a kind of an interesting and slightly controversial topic because I've, I've had people say to me, you know, well, you should be pro badger culling because they're, they're bumblebees. And, and, and they do, but I'm not. Um, anyway, that's another story. Uh, but they, they, they've been pleading with these bumblebee nests for many years, but they dig up the whole nest. They don't, they don't eat the adult bees or flowers, but at night they sniff out the nests and they excavate them and they eat everything. They eat, they eat the adult bees. And they don't seem bothered by the sting. And they eat the, the, the comb, the brood, and everything else. And we thought, well, if badgers can sniff out bumblebee nests, then presumably a dog could sniff out a bumblebee nest. Dogs are very good at sniffing things out, but they, they use them for finding all sorts of things. And there's a, a dog, an army training camp for dogs and horses in Melton Mowbray, where they train them for dogs, not the horses, to find explosives. <laughs> you might be able to do that with horses, I don't know. Um, anyway. Um, no. Right. Don't worry. Uh, and and so we, uh, one Friday afternoon, after we got back from a club lunch. We thought we, we plucked up the courage to ring the army and say, "Would you train us a dog to find bumblebee nests?" And we didn't really think that they would, um, but to their credit, they did. I think they were they were bored of training um, uh, dogs to get blown up, and they fancied doing something different. I think. Uh, so we sent them. We took they actually drove up there. We took them some bumblebee nest material, and they trained. Chad here uh, to sniff it out, uh, or at least they, they tried. He was rubbish, unfortunately, and, uh, <laughs> and he was sacked after just two weeks uh, and was replaced by, by Quinn, who was pretty good. He found bumblebee nests and, and they delivered him to us. And he, he spent two years up in the uh, Outer Hebrides finding nests of those great yellow bumblebees. Um, uh, but he, he, he didn't find as many as we thought he should be able to find. He was only finding about one a day, which was, uh, it was a lot of work for his hand just to find one bumblebee the next day. Um, so we actually asked the army eventually to check, train a third one. This is Toby, this is Steph, Steph O'Connor, who she did her whole PhD with Toby looking for bumblebee nests. And he was the best we ever got. He, he found hundreds of nests in his, in his three years with Steph. Um, but he still, we could never get to the bottom of it. He would find really little tiny bumblebee nests that we would never have noticed ourselves. But then he would walk straight past a whopping red bumblebee nest that we knew was there without twitching his nose at all. Um, and then we see, he would find some and not others and we could not work out. They presumably they smelled different and he was just peeing into something about certain nests, but we could never get to the bottom of what it was. Um, and so ultimately, we could never really survey nests and find them all in the way we'd hoped. But they did find out all sorts of interesting things. So when they found bumblebee nests, they set, set up a, a camera filming the nest entrance uh, that filmed continuously, 24 hours a day, until, <coughs> until the nest expired. Because we wanted to find out how, 
what attacked them, how often nests were successfully produced in new queens, and, and all that kind of thing. So um, she had 30 nests that she was all filming simultaneously once that Toby had found. And I'm just going to show you if it works a little bit of footage of uh, one of these nests. So it's, it's terrible resolution footage, as you can see. Um, this is not BBC wildlife kind of quality. Um, but uh, with a bit of luck, um, this will work. I, I should explain, actually, that little black blob there, if you can see, is, the, is a little en the entrance to a bumblebee nest. It's only about half an inch wide, a centimetre wide. Uh, and there's a bee here. There's the white bits of the wings. She's <coughs> just about to disappear into her, into her nest. And so let's see what happens next. Another bee is going to come from the top in a second. <laughs> so it, it, no one had ever seen this before. Um, it turns out that great tits um, uh, commonly uh, find bumblebee nests and they come back day after day and they just sit outside and they just pick off the workers um, and they've learned how to, to kind of dissect them without getting stung. Each, it's kind of interesting, each bird has its own way of doing this. Uh, most commonly they snip, they sort of chop off the top of the thorax, like taking the top of a hard boiled egg and scoop out the, the flight muscles, the tasty bit. Uh, but some of them would chop the bottom off and go back going that way. Um, so you, next to the bumblebee nest, you find this little pile of identically dismembered bees, um, which is kind of sad, but presumably this is completely natural. Um, I'm not suggesting we should start culling great tits either. Um, they're probably doing it for centuries, millennia, but no one, no one would ever seen it. Um, I guess if you were walk, walking through the woods and you saw a great tit sitting on a woodland floor, you wouldn't realize what it was doing. It would fly up before you noticed anything. Um, but uh, yeah. Bit of new natural history that no one had ever seen before, which was kind of cool. Okay, so I showed you the, 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 those maps of that spe uh, the great yellow bumblebee declining, and mentioned lots of other species have declined. Um, I just want to say a little bit more about why they've declined before I talk about what we can do to, to, to help. Um, so the biggest driver is, is broadly kind of the way farming has changed, the way the countryside has changed, and in particular one thing. So it's a bit of a small picture, I'll show you a much bigger one in a second. We used to have in Britain about 7 million acres of flower-rich grasslands, which is a kind of slightly vague term that becomes these lowland hay meadows and chalk bound. Um, 7 million acres, and we, we lost about 97 and a half, 98% of it in the 20th century. The whole habitat was just swept away um, to make way for other forms of, life, of, of farming arable fields or silage fields. We, did, we, we switched from using hay to, as a fodder for livestock in the winter to using silage. And a silage field has no flowers at all. A cereal field has no flowers at all. And if you're a bee and you need those flowers, then obviously that change is pretty disastrous. Um, but also there, there are other aspects of farming intensification. Right? Essentially modern farms have very few flowers uh, because of herbicides and everything else. They've enabled farmers to grow crops. There's almost perfect pure monocultures. Uh, which leaves no room for, for bees or any other kind of wildlife, really. I'll say a tiny bit more about that in a second. There's also big issues with disease that, that I could talk to you about, but they, I won't because it's complicated and a bit dull. But basically, we've spread bee diseases around the world with honeybees, um, and later, more recently, with commercial bumblebees that are weird for tomato pollination. And so we've, we've taken diseases, say, to the Americas from Europe and from Asia to Europe. And so uh, the bees flying around in the wild are being infected with diseases that they have no natural resistance to because they come from other parts of the world. Um, I'll say more about pesticides, and uh, I won't say any more about climate change, but there's some recent evidence that climate change, as you might guess from what I said earlier about bumblebees liking cold weather and overheating and hot weather, climate change isn't good news if you're a bumblebee. Um, but I won't go into that anymore. Uh, but anyway, so just. These flower-rich meadows that we used to have so much of, absolutely beautiful, um, but they're nearly all gone. And you can see, obviously, why. If you lose this, then that's, that's not so good for a bee. Um, and we've turned it into stuff like this, which yeah, you can see all over the world, just, just intensive farmland. Um, there's an interesting debate to be had about you know, whether this is, obviously, we need to feed people, and there's a compromise has to be made somewhere. But whether this is the only way we can produce food, I would question. But anyway, that's a story for another day. 
Pesticides, I mentioned briefly, and I'll say a little bit more about them because it's a very topical subject at the moment. It's been in the news the last couple of years quite a lot. Um, these, so this is, they also don't put too much information on the slide, and I'm entirely aware that this slide has far too much information on it, but it's for a reason, and it illustrates a point. Um, so we're doing, doing research at Sussex on, on bee health, bumblebee health in particular, in, in local farmland and the effects of pesticides and so on on them. And we asked the farmers around here that like, you own the land we're working on to tell us what pesticides they were using in their, in their fields. And this is one field, one in, in one year. It's just it, the, the farmer told us what pesticides, what chemicals he was applying to the field. Um, so this was a, a, an oilseed rape field that was sown in August uh, of 2012, um, and it was harvested in June of 2013. And these were the chemicals that were applied to that field in, in the 10 months or whatever it is between sowing and harvest, which seems like quite a lot to me. I hadn't realized quite how many were being applied. A couple of them are fertilizers, but, but 20 of them are different types of pesticides, insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, molluscicides, this blizzard of stuff um, being thrown on there, um, including a, a, this stuff, biomethoxin at the start, which is a seed dressing, which is a type of insecticide called the neonicotinoid, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a second. Uh, but then lots of other chemicals subsequently, including pyrethroid insecticides and so on. Um, they give them really funny names. Um, I, the, these are the, the kind of brand names of the insecticides. And it's, We've got shadow and crawler and dictate and so on. And then <coughs> poor old Gandalf. Gandalf is now he's a pyrethroid insecticide, apparently. Um, if I was here, I wouldn't be very happy about that. But anyway, um, so if you're a bee visiting this field to visit the flowers or feeding in, in flowers in the field market, you're going to be exposed to a whole cocktail of chemicals. Um, and there's, there's, there's a very significant body of evidence accumulated over the last few years that that is doing them harm, um, particularly this long-term chronic exposure to, to a whole mixture of different chemicals. But most of the attention has been focused actually on one particular group of chemicals. I don't know whether some of you may have heard of, of these things. I mentioned them a second ago, near the cottonoids. I'll just say a tiny bit about it. Like I, I give a whole talk about this issue. Uh, it's quite complicated to go into, but I, I'm giving you the, the very, very short version here. Um, so these are, are the newest type of insecticide on the market. They've been around for 20 odd years. Um, they're synthetic variants on nicotine, as you might guess from the name. Um, they're mostly applied as seed dressings. So this is, this is oil seed, rape seed that's been treated with um, the insecticide. So the farmer just buys it pre-treated and sows it in the ground. And they're systemic. They, 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 the idea is they're sucked up by the plant as it grows, and they go to all parts of the plant and protect it against insect pests, but that also means they go into the pollen and the nectar, and they're, they're neurotoxins, they're extremely powerful toxic neurotoxins, particularly to insects. You can see how popular they've proved, this shows you the amount since 1994 when they were first used to today, we're currently using about 115,000 kilos of these chemicals each year on the UK, um, uh, and they're, they're staggeringly poisonous to insects. Um, so, so the way we me measure how toxic something is, is through a, the LD50, the lethal dose that kills 50% of the animals in your test. Um, and so imidacloprid is one of these neonicotinoids, and it takes four nanograms to, do, to deliver the LD50 to a honeybee. So it's a 50-50 chance that each individual bee will die or not. And if, obviously if it doesn't die, it's probably not very well. Um, but anyway, so that's four billionths of a gram. To put that in context, that means that a one teaspoon, five grams, um, is enough to give an LD50 to one and a quarter billion honeybees. Um, and compare that to DDT, which most of people have heard of as this horrible stuff that we long ago banned because it was bad for the environment. And I'm not suggesting for a second we should go back to DDT. But purely from a bee's perspective, it's about 7,000 times less toxic. Um, than these new generations of insecticides. So 115,000 kilos and one teaspoon is enough to kill one and a quarter billion plant bees. He doesn't, he doesn't need much of it to get in the wrong place, and it's going to have big impacts, not just on bees, but on any other insect, like butterflies and so on, living in farmland. And as I said, there's pretty good evidence that that is happening. 
just to warn you, you can still buy these things from your garden centre. Um, and it, I find it really staggering and depressing that every garden centre you go in has a huge aisle of chemicals for you to throw in your garden. I don't think anyone needs any pesticides in their garden, personally. But anyway, um, that's a, also an issue for another day. But you really don't need to throw insecticides onto your flowers and vegetables. Um, I don't. I've got a big vegetable patch. I grow loads of food. And almost invariably, if you've got a nice healthy garden without pesticides, natural enemies will come along and eat the pests if you're just patient and give it a bit of time. Um, and I really wouldn't be putting this stuff here, near mix in your garden. Um, they're very toxic, not just to insects, but actually, although they're less toxic to people and dogs and so on, they are toxic to people and dogs. If you've got a dog or a cat and you drip stuff onto the back of its neck, your vet will advise you to prophylactically treat them against fleas and other things with, pro this is the most popular product on the market, Advocate. That is imidacloprid, the stuff I was just talking about. And the, the, the dose you're supposed to put on your dog every month through its life, um, if for a medium-sized dog, is enough to kill 60 million honeybees or 60 partridges, which is an interesting and not very helpful statistic, <laughs> but it, and it doesn't really matter when 60 partridges come and eat your dog. Um, which is unlikely, but it just makes you wonder, where does that go? If your children stroke the dog, if your dog jumps in the pond, uh, just after you put the stuff on it, that's a, or there's enough chemical to kill every insect in your pond. Um, so, um, I, I, this also is something we should be concerned about, I think. Uh, final slide on pesticides. Um, this is just kind of what just makes me laugh for it. Three um, seeds for bees with your bee killing. So you can grow beautiful flowers and attract all the insects and then kill them really efficiently. Anyway, just so to finish the doom and gloom, uh, we need to avoid this. So these are people in China, close to where we think bees originated, 30 million, bumblebees originated 30 million years ago. They are hand pollinated their apple and pear orchards because there are no bees left. There's nothing to pollinate the trees and they have to do it by hand and send their kids up high. And clearly we need to avoid that happening um, here. Imagine a farmer trying to hand pollinate his obviously great crop. Um, so what can we do? Um, well the good news is that there's lots we can do. You can get involved in helping bees in lots of different ways. So it's very different. A lot of conservation stores are a bit doom and gloom because you feel helpless. You don't know what you can do about polar bears in the Arctic or, or the rainforests or whatever. But with bees you can help because they live all around us in our gardens and towns and, and so on. Uh, what can you do then? I'm just going to run through a few things you can do. Um, the, the top end, if you happen to be a farmer, and I haven't upset you already, um, then you might consider sowing a, an area of trying to recreate one of these flower-rich grasslands that we had so much of. This isn't something that's practical for most people, but you can do it on a smallish scale if you've got a big garden. Um, as I said, we lost most of this flower-rich habitat, but there's been lots of research on how to, how to recreate it, and it can be done, it takes time. Um, and so my book, should anyone want one, um, it, the second one is about um, a farm down in France that I bought with 33 acres that was wheat, on the, it was an arable field uh, 13 years ago, and it's now uh, a field full of flowers, and it's kind of the story of, of that change. And it's, really, it's really been wonderful to see it be colonized by different flowers and butterflies and bees and, and so on over time. It's possible to recreate this habitat and, and if anyone is lucky enough to have an area of land that they can do that on then then fantastic. But I realise that most people don't, especially in Lewis where the gardens tend to be rather small sadly. Um, what else can you do? You can help in raising awareness about these issues. So and that's what I'm doing here, that's what my books are, are, are largely about. Um, people don't care about something if they don't know about it, they can't do it. Um, and a lot of people are com just completely ignorant of these issues. They think, as I said earlier, there's just one species of bee. They might have vaguely heard there's something wrong with the bees, um, but that'll be about it, sadly. Um, uh, so the more people we can tell about these things, the better everyone can, can do that. Um, obviously, some ways of raising awareness are more efficient than others. We, the, the, I launched a charity called the Bumblebee Conservation Trust 10 years ago, and we were really lucky that the, the environment editor at the time, persuaded, uh, the independent, persuaded his boss to devote the first three pages of the independent to bumblebees. This was back one day in 2006 when the 190,000 readers of the independent will have all found out about the importance of bumblebees and what they can do to help. So that kind of thing is obviously really powerful, but 
just telling one person is, is a start. And it's really important to keep young children engaged. Little kids love wildlife. They seem to be intuitively fascinated by bugs and beasties and want to catch them and so on. Uh, but by the time they're teenagers, usually all they want to do is squash things that buzz. They're frightened of anything that, that buzzes around, anything that's going to sting them and so on. Um, and, and we need to stop that happening. And it's difficult to know how, but part of the problem, I think, is that kids just don't get many opportunities to engage with, with nature, uh, as perhaps as many as they used to. Um, these pictures show a before and after. So this, this is a, a class of kids up in Scotland, in the Hebrides, that uh, we, we've developed a two-hour um, lesson about the great yellow bumblebee and bumblebees more generally um, for Scottish primary school kids. And at the beginning, they're asked to draw a bumblebee. And they draw these kind of lobby, uh, not very realistic things, the cartoon, yellow and black striking things, the wrong numbers of legs and wings and whatever. They're only really about seven, so fair enough. Um, two hours later, they've learned all about bumblebees. And we asked them to draw a bumblebee again, and they produce these much more accurate diagrams with two pairs of wings and three pairs of legs and all the rest of it. Not that that matters in the slightest. The, the, the important thing is, look, how much happier they've become. So look at this kid here. <laughs> really not very impressed at the prospect of two hours on bumblebees. It really is two hours on <laughs> Hopefully, they'll remember those two hours. These kids, these kids actually in this area, this is on Lewis in the far northwest of the Hebrides, where there are those great yellow bumblebees. And lots of these kids are crofters' kids. So, and this was, this was about eight years ago, so they'll be driving the tractor there. Maybe they won't plow a patch of flowers or spray the insect or something or whatever. We'll see. OK, nearly there. Um, if you want to get involved in collecting data and trying to monitor bee populations and learning more about what you can do in your garden, you should have a look at the website. We've started a new citizen science club to try and gather data on long-term population trends of pollinators generally, not just bumblebees, but all pollinators. And we've got six different schemes that people can join in in their back gardens to do things like try and making a hoverfly lagoon, which is a breeding habitat for hoverflies, to make solitary bee nest boxes, to um, use pan trapping to see how many pollinators you have in your garden and so on. There's lots of things you can join in if you're interested. But, um, Somewhere here, I've got some leaflets. They might be on that table over there that you can take away if you, if you want to find out more. Um, the obvious thing, the most relevant to this event particularly, that everyone can do if you've got a garden, or even if it's just window boxes, um, is plant some bee-friendly flowers. Um, and there's lots of information out there as to which ones are good, um, but uh, some quick do's and don'ts. So these things uh, are the sorts of annual bedding plants that you might pick up outside being here or home base or whatever in the spring and put in your garden. Um, they're very bright, they flower for a long time, but I personally think they're completely hideous and I'm strongly encouraging to not buy these horrible things. They've probably been drenched in insecticides before you buy them anyway, uh, but even if they hadn't been, you wouldn't see insects going anywhere near most of these things all summer long. They've been very intensively bred um, uh, and they've lost their scent, their nectar, their pollen, or they're just such a weird shape that these and no one can get into them. Uh, one way or another, they're useless. They're parodies of proper flowers. Uh, you might as well just have plastic flowers in your garden and be done. So get rid of those horrible things. <laughs> and, and I don't really know why the name is there. Um, um, this is just a really nice example of, of a good and a bad version of a flower, the sorts of things that the breeders do. And, and most people would think that the flower on the left is beautiful. Fair enough, it's a rose, as I'm sure you've all realized. But it's useless if you're a bee. Uh, whereas this one on the right, a more old-fashioned variety, a single flower, uh, with just one set of petals, bees love. Um, that one on the left is a mutant where the, the anthers that produce the pollen uh, are instead been turned into petals. Um, so it, it looks pretty, but it's a waste of space as far as insects are concerned. So just generally keep an eye out for the things. Double, double varieties of flowers tend to be rubbish for pollinators, whereas the single ones... I bought a, a rhododendron the other day. Um, uh, for, for my wife, because she loves her endings. And when it flowered, I realized that it had, it had no anthers, it just had extra sets of petals. I, I can't quite persuade her that I should dig it up and throw it in the compost bin, but um, I was really annoyed. I what the hell is this? Anyway, um, so good, good examples, these kind of things, traditional cottage garden flowers, there's loads of advice. Uh, the Buzz Club website and my own university webpage have a long list of pictures and a bit of information about um, pretty much every good bee flower 
There's tons to choose from. They're really pretty, traditional, mostly perennials, cottage garden flowers. Once you've got them, they last forever. Most of them are no trouble to look after at all. Um, and if you grow just a few of them, your garden will be full of happy bees. Um, squeeze in a few wildflowers too, some beautiful wildflowers um, that you might be able to get hold of the seeds for. Um, I haven't got time to go into them in, in any depth, but just to pick one top left, Viper's Bugloss. Um, it's really easy to grow, isn't it? It's a biennial, um, grows to about a, a yard or so tall, and it's covered in bees when it flowers. It's, and it's really, really pretty, it's no, you know, it looks lovely in a herbaceous board alongside doing more conventional garden plants. Um, I also think we should be trying to push for, and there are projects going on in Lewis to, to do this, um, to get some council owned lands that uh, turned into, into flowers. There are so many mown verges and roundabouts and parks and so on where they endlessly mow it, there's no flowers. Um, it doesn't have to be like that. So up in Stirling where I used to work, there's a campaign group called On the Verge and they've been badgering anyone who owns any kind of land in Stirling, mainly the council, but also other organisations like the local primary school, the rugby club, and so on, to let them sow wildflower mixes on these uh, bits of grass. And this, there are now 52 patches like this uh, dotted all around Stirling. This is a roundabout close to the middle of Stirling, which used to be just neatly mown. And now look at this, and it's teeming with bees and butterflies and so on. If we could do, do this on every roundabout and every road verge and persuade every garden to just have a few flowers, uh, bee friendly flowers and so on, uh, and not use the pesticides, we could turn urban areas into huge bee and wildlife nature reserves, which I think would be very cool. Um, it's very easy to make nest boxes for nest sites for solitary bees. Just drill some holes in a, in a post or a piece of wood and stick it on the wall. So this is just, it looks rubbish, I know, but this is just an old fence post I had, so I just drilled some holes in it. And within 20 minutes of drilling the holes, eight millimeter drill bit, I had these um, Osmia mason bees turning up a couple of springs ago, and they come back every year. Uh, they'll be out in March, so if you want to do this, do it soon. Uh, and then later in the year, um, any holes that haven't been filled up by Osmia will be taken over by, if you're lucky, by leaf cutter bees, which I mentioned at the beginning, and there's one snipping out the bits of leaf to line, line its hole. And they're really interesting things to watch. Kids absolutely love it. Um, those are some, perhaps some more, some smaller, more compact designs. You can just chop up bits of bamboo, stick them in a box or whatever. There's loads of ways of making these little nest sites. And they do work. They, they, they don't, I can guarantee they work. But most of the time, you'll get at least some bees using them. OK, so to wrap up, um, Hopefully I've, I've convinced you, if you weren't already convinced, that bees are important to us and that we really need to look after them. Um, but I kind of think we, that actually bees are quite a good foot in the door to, to engage people, to talk to people about the importance more generally of looking after the environment. So it isn't just bees that are important. It's an e they're an easy one to explain to people, that bees pollinate crops that we need and therefore we need to look after the bees, just out of self-interest. But actually, out of self-interest, we need to look after everything else too. Um, uh, it isn't just bees that are disappearing, actually most of them are in trouble. And lots of organisms are important to us in maintaining soil health and recycling uh, nutrients and organic matter and dung and so on and controlling pests. We need, to, we need to maintain healthy ecosystems so far as we can, not just look after bees. But to go back to the bees, the bees have been pollinating um, our crops for 10,000 years, since we started growing crops. And for most of that period, they've been doing it without any thanks from us. But now they're in trouble, they're disappearing. Uh, and we can all help. And if everyone dis goes away from there and does one thing, grows one patch of bee-friendly flowers, makes one bee hotel or whatever, then it really would make a difference. If we could get everyone around the country doing that, um, it would transform Britain and make it much more bee-friendly. So do something. OK. just. Say, should you want to, there's some books on sale. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening to me. Thank you.